Uh, we are produced by Chillin Dylan Bishop and ready to welcome our next guest, whose name ends in a vowel, so I'm already having a good morning. Maria Russo <laughs> is here. She's a candidate for the House of Delegates in the 100th. This is the seat currently held by Bill Ridenauer. Bill will be on the program tomorrow morning, uh, by the way. Maria, good morning. Thanks for coming in. Good morning. Thank you so much for having me. I see your signs all around Shepherdstown. Good. That's what I want to hear. <laughs> yeah, I see it because I, I, I'll go home that way uh, mm -hmm. most times. And I saw, I guess, about a month ago is when I started seeing those. Yep, exactly. There are several of them there. And uh, that's all I know about you is, is that you're here. You're going to wait till after the show to have a cookie. I can't wait. And then that you're running for the House of Delegates. Tell me more about you. Yes. So thank you again for having me this morning. Uh, my name is Maria Russo. I'm running for District 100. And I grew up in Jefferson County. I have a very deep love for this place and the people who make this place what it is. Um, I grew up uh, being educated in Jefferson County schools. I later went on to teach in Jefferson County schools and to coach track. And I grew up in 4-H. I went to Tri-County and State 4-H camps. And so I have a really deep um, appreciation for what makes this place what it is. Mm -hmm. And I left West Virginia to go to school. Um, I started my career outside of the state and I studied public policy. So I've been working in that realm. Um, but I really, I was working on some cool projects, but I really felt like a piece of me was missing. Um, and I really knew that it was time to come home. So in 2020, when COVID-19 started, I came home and I've been doing public policy work here in the state of West Virginia since then. And, and that's kind of a broad general statement, but what does that mean you've been doing public policy work? Yeah, so I've uh, worked in a few different realms of policy throughout my career, but I'm currently working for West Virginia Rivers. So I do water policy work for the state of West Virginia. And that looks like a lot of different things. Um, I have spent some time at the Capitol in Charleston um, working with this legislature that's currently in office and working on some legislation, but I also do a lot of community engagement work too. So I try to tie our policy work to advocacy and make sure that the impacted communities are involved in the process of policy making. Have you ever run for office before? I have not, I'm a first time candidate. What is uh, the moment, what was the moment or what is the issue that made you drive to this decision here? It was probably when I got home from Charleston after my first legislative session, which was in 2023. And after working on the ground at the Capitol and really seeing how it worked to make policies and make laws, I said, I want to be more involved. And it was probably I helped to pass the PFAS Protection Act, which was a really big win in 2023 that we were really excited about. I've worked on that piece of legislation since then to kind of help implement it around the state. Um, and it was really that work when I learned about the water contamination that people were facing statewide and, and seeing how it worked to really um, fix a problem like that is something that I just I'm so interested in. I care about how our systems work and how they don't work and how they could be, uh, you know, operating more effectively for people. You're running as a Democrat. Tell me about the voter registration breakdown in Delegate District 100 in terms of Republicans, Democrats, independents, third parties. Yes, great question. So in District 100, the most amount of registered voters are independents. The next is Republicans, and then the last amount is Democrats. Um, and independents I kind of categorize uh, as that could be independents, no party, green party. It's kind of an unaffiliated group. Um, and so in my campaign, I'm really working to talk to all people. I think it really is going to require all of us to make the change we want to see in District 100 together. And so I'm working on talking to Democrats, independents, Republicans every day to understand what their needs are and make sure that I can effectively address them. What percentage of those folks are independents or unaffiliated? It's just, it's about a third of each of them, um, but independents have just tipped over the scales. So it's probably about 35% independent um, and then a solid 30% Republican and then kind of and what are the geographical uh, borders of the 100th? Yes, yeah, so District 100 stretches from downtown Shepherdstown all the way up to the mountain, and it includes all points in between. So that includes Shepherdstown, um, over by Uvilla and River Road. Um, I live in Shenandoah Junction, just off of Flowing Springs Road. So that area is included Bakerton, Harper's Ferry, Bolivar, Blue Ridge Acres, and then up to Shannondale. So it's really kind of a long, skinny district. Mr. Gilstrap. Um, <clears throat> um, good morning. Good I'm morning. looking at your uh, website here. 
Maria, you are committed to ensuring clean water and air, improving pay for public employees, upgrading infrastructure, supporting emergency medical uh, emergency and medical services and such. Um, these are all very admirable and, and, and frankly sort of vanilla. Do you know of anybody who opposes these things? No, and that was my goal, is that I really want to address the local needs of the people. So my platform is uh, really separated into three categories, infrastructure being the first, the second being education, specifically public education, and then jobs because I really feel like those are the pieces of having a strong community. And if we invest in one of those areas, it helps contribute to the others. And if we have strong infrastructure, education, and jobs, we can't go wrong. Our people will be supported and our communities will be uplifted. So picking that one, just going with jobs, what would you do that is not currently being done? Yeah, that's the age old question. Um, I think as far as economics, we really have to make sure that we are, I say they're all related because I think that if we need to attract responsible businesses to District 100 and to Jefferson County. And in order to do that, we need to have strong infrastructure in place. We need to make sure that there is water available. We need to make sure that we have an educated workforce that is ready to take part in that industry. If you look at District 100 currently, we have some amazing um, tourism options that people come to Harper's Ferry. It's unlike any other place in, I would say, the country. Um, but, you know, it's a beautiful, we have the mountains. We have, I have two rivers in my district. Um, so. I think if we really work to emphasize the positive parts of District 100 and lift those up, we'll be able to attract just more young people coming to the area. I'm a young person who grew up here and I came back to West Virginia and I want that to be possible for more young people in District 100. Is that currently not being done? Well, I think it's being done, but I think that it could be supported further. What does that mean? <sighs> I think that that means taking the positive assets that we have and making sure that we are prioritizing resources towards that. Um, so right now, you know, I think we have an, some, an amazing amount of small businesses in District 100, but part of my goal in my campaign has been to talk to the small business owners and make sure they're getting the support from the state that they really need. Um, one thing I've heard time and time again from small businesses, I'm actually a small business owner myself, and I've heard from people that it's really difficult in the state of West Virginia because for a lot of things, they have to go to Charleston to get different licenses. Now that has been made a little better by the Eastern Panhandle station up here in Martinsburg for the tax division and the SOS office. So they're trying to provide more resources up here for people, but we are the furthest area from the capital. Um, and so I think that presents some challenges to people that I just want to help support and figure out what do our small businesses need so that our area can thrive. Keep decentralizing Charleston. <laughs> <laughs> 30 years ago, I got a real estate license in West Virginia, and I was shocked to find out I had to drive to Charleston to take the exam. Yes. It blew me away that I couldn't take the exam around here. I had to drive 300 miles to take a real estate exam. Dylan just reached, looked over and smiled at me like, you got something, Dylan. <laughs> Uh, recently, I, I enjoy going down to the, the Devonshire pub in Shepherdstown oh, yeah, and, uh, and, uh, for, on a karaoke night. And Where, they where'd just, that come from? Huh? <laughs> where, where'd, that, where'd that bit of information come from? Anyway, uh, they were just recently, they just recently changed ownership and they were closed for three months because of it. Part of it was the way they wanted to, uh, you know, change, you know, re renovate a little bit. But part of it was like all of the certifications and stuff that they needed to get. They were closed for three months. It was, it was like... That I think they were starting to get worried about if they would actually ever get back open. Yeah, that's too because much. Because they had to keep take. going down to Charleston for different things. Yeah, that's exactly. just that's too, three months is a long time. But at least we now know when where to find Dylan yeah. on karaoke. Now. <laughs> An example of a successful small business, right? Matt Miller. I would just want to know if the karaoke was successful. That's what I was. Like. Well, let's have yeah. him sing. What do you what do you, what do you sing when you sing karaoke, Dylan? Oh, you know, a bunch of do any anything really. Well, I. I'm not going to go into too much detail. I probably, it's too late for that. I see, I see what I've that done. That could be an Eastern Panhandle <laughs> Talk segment. There you go. Uh, yeah. Uh, a remote. <laughs> Road trip. You mentioned earlier your opportunities to be involved uh, with the legislature as well as with community through your work. How do you believe that action has maybe prepared you for an opportunity to become a part of the legislature? 
So I, uh, like I said, I was down in Charleston for two different legislative sessions. And I think through that experience, like I said, I really learned the process of what it takes to have a bill become law. And it is really quite a lengthy process. I don't think a lot of people have a good idea of what that looks like. And the biggest piece that I think surprised me was how important relationship building really is. So it really requires talking to people and getting them to buy in to what you're trying to do and the positive changes that you're trying to make. So while I was down there, I was working on water policy concerns and some people would say, oh, how were you ever successful in that legislature? And I said, people want clean water. We might disagree on how to get there, but most people want clean water for their kids, for their grandkids. So it's really, um, a bipartisan issue and I think it really taught me a lot about how to work with other people and how to be a team player and so I'm really committed to working with people across the aisle working with people who have different perspectives than me mm -hmm. I think that's a quality of a healthy democracy is being able to have different perspectives but to all come together around a table and say how can we take our different perspectives and make a policy solution out of that so when you said earlier you were there, you saw, you said, I want to, I want to get more involved, is it, was it something good you saw, something bad you saw, or just the intriguing part of, I want to be a part of this? Good question. It was a mix, I would okay. say. I would say um, some pieces of it I was so intrigued by and I, I was so excited about, um, and that was exciting to find out. But some pieces of it I think operated a little bit less than ideal, and I was really sitting around some tables, first of all, West Virginia has the least amount of women legislators of all 50 states. And so there were some committee rooms where me and a couple other colleagues of women, we were, you know, very outnumbered um, in the rooms. And so that was something that was interesting. Just the representation is a piece of it. Um, and then also just, you know, the kind of sometimes extreme viewpoints that were being brought into the discussion. And I think when we go to very extreme viewpoints we fail to represent a large group of people in west virginia um, and a large group of people in district 100 and so i was really committed to making sure that our community voices were represented in those rooms in charleston is there a single female representative out of the eastern panhandle delegation between the house of delegates and the well patricia rocker, senator rocker, rocker yeah. yes and is that it yes yeah. senator geffert was there for a little while mm -hmm. Right now, you that's one. Yes, exactly. You probably hung around with Patricia a lot that day. <laughs> that day I and I see Senator Rucker around. I appreciate her for her work. And, you know, she, she talks about that a lot at mm -hmm. the legislature of needing to have more women in the rooms. And I appreciate that. Would you describe yourself as a policy wonk? <laughs> I hope not. <laughs> I hope to be more connected to the people. Um, and so I would, I would describe myself more as a... Um, intrigued by policy but but led by the the will of the people so you're a policy wonk, I, like, <laughs> I guess so yeah you you painted me into a corner yeah uh, but there's nothing wrong with that it's a, it's a person who's trying to get a deeper understanding of of how the sausage is made basically exactly right you, you, uh, italian to, to italian uh, yeah that's a very important thing i, I gotta bring italian sausage into the conversation <laughs> at some point along the way by the way sweet italian sausage mild or, or hot it's hot Definitely hot. Yeah. And you know what? Oh, Italian sausage has actually come up during my campaign. If I can take a second to Please. share at the Jefferson County Fair, which I spent a lot of time at, I had people coming up to me and saying, where are the Italian sausages? They were so upset. Sure. And they said, if you are elected, I need you to get the sausages back at the fair. That was their top priority. Why so, didn't they have sausages at the fair? I don't know. I couldn't. I never found them all week. So stay this tuned. This is a scandal. I, it is a scandal. <laughs> Spread the word. And I know now to call this out. As this, I made sure everybody knew. Uh, your district is the 100th in Jefferson County, and Jefferson County has gotten a reputation as being anti-business, deserved or not. Uh, that has been the reputation for Jefferson County. Are there certain businesses in Jefferson County you would welcome over others in regards to trying to bring business into the county? Absolutely. So when we look to the small businesses that I talked about previously, we have so many examples. We have River Riders, Bavarian Inn, Maria's Taqueria. Um, we have so many that people love, the dev, as was discussed earlier. And so I think that we have to look to those businesses to see what they have done well. And I think that they have, as I've stated previously, they've responded to the needs of the people. People want to go on the river. They want to eat good food. They want to 
drink good beer at the Bavarian and at the Dev and just have an overall beautiful experience when they come to West Virginia or as a, as a resident here. And so I think we, again, need to play up on those strengths as we attract businesses. I do know that, um, you know, over the last few years, especially with the rock wool situation, um, there were a lot of concerns about what businesses may be coming here. But I don't want us to think of business as a bad thing because business is a very big word. I think we should be attracting responsible businesses that are going to care about our resources and make sure, again, to uh, promote the beautiful aspects of our community. Talk to me. Just one more here, John. Uh, solar in Jefferson County is very controversial. Yes, it's a huge issue right now. Talk to me about your position on solar. Absolutely. So I am a big believer that we need to protect the farmland of Jefferson County. We need to make sure to protect the rural nature. I grew up on a small farm outside of Shepherdstown, but I, that is what Jefferson County has always been about. It is an agricultural place. The farms have made Jefferson County what it is, and I think we have to protect them. The other problem I see with the large utility scale solar is that that energy is not being used in our local community. It is being exported out of Jefferson County, mostly to Northern Virginia, and our utility rates are not going down because of that. If anything, our electricity rates are going up in the district and across West Virginia. And so I think we need to be very careful about a situation like this. I, I do not approve of how the solar projects are being um, you know, fast forward, fast tracked at this time. And I think we have to be very careful. Now, I do believe in renewable energy as part of West Virginia's diverse energy portfolio, right? I would love to see solar, but it has to be built out in the right spaces. It has to be on commercial buildings, not on our precious farmland. But if I own the farm mm -hmm. and I don't want to farm it anymore and someone comes along and says, hey, we can take your land and make it a profit center for you as the owner of that land, don't I have personal property rights that allow me to profit from it? You do, and that's the difficult piece that's the larger issue, right, is that farming has become a, a very difficult profession where it's very hard to make a profit these days. It's very hard to even stay, you know, keep the budgets. Uh, you know, it, it, most farmers are losing money right now, and mm -hmm. so we subsidize farmers. Um, to be able to do the important work that they do. But I, I think that is part of the biggest challenge is figuring out how we are going to support our agricultural community and provide them with options that does not look like only selling out to solar farms. Mr. Gilstrap. Yeah, I want to go, you, you mentioned, again, from your website, bringing more <clears throat> good paying jobs to Jefferson County. And then when you, you talk about the small businesses, you talk about river rafting and, and restaurants. Are those the good paying jobs you're looking for or is a rock will more in line with the, the good paying jobs you're looking for? I think it takes a mix. I think it's a diverse amount of jobs that um, that we need to be attracting here to Jefferson County and supporting. Um, and so I think that, you know, if we have clean and planned growth, then I think with that in mind and with that being the value at the center, we can attract businesses that can support people, support families. Um, that's a very important topic that I'm hearing from a lot of constituents is that, you know, as families, they are having trouble making ends meet. And so I think that we have to uh, provide a diverse array of jobs. Another topic that we're hearing, especially in my district, is a lot of people that are traveling and commuting to Loudoun County or to Washington County, um, which both border my district, to have even higher paying jobs. And so there are higher wages, especially for state employees, for teachers, which is yeah. why that's another part of my platform. And um, so they, they're able to go 15, 20 minutes down the road and get three times the salary. And so that is not going to work for our families. They can't make ends meet to stay here in Jefferson County, even though they want to be working here. So I do think we have to come up with some creative solutions, and I have a few ideas on what that can look like. In retrospect, was it, was Rockwell a good thing or a bad thing for Jefferson County, and do we need more of those? I do not believe we need more Rockwell specifically. I, I can't. Not that company, but, yeah. <laughs> but that, that, sort of, I mean, that, that sort of industry. Relatively high paying. It turns out the economic, the uh, environmental impact was not what everybody had feared. 
Yeah, and they are using a lot of water at Rockwool, um, and that's definitely something that people are concerned about in Jefferson County is water usage and being sure that we have the appropriate amount of water resources. I also, you know, as that was, there were many debates um, folded up into the Rockwell situation, uh, one of which was um, whether or not those good paying jobs would be union jobs and whether or not they would be hiring local people. Um, and so those are things that I'm very tuned into and care a lot about. I'm supported by a lot of our labor unions um, and I want to make sure that our working people have their rights and have an option of a safe workplace, have high wages that they can support themselves. And so I think it's a pretty multifaceted issue. Um, I think that we can also look to other successful partnerships in District 100 beyond, you know, I've talked about small businesses and we've talked about Rockwell, but there's a lot in between as well. Um, I was just talking to some folks last night about that, mu that music means it's time to wrap it up, Maria. <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> oh, no, don't go away, because when we come back, we'll give you a final 50 seconds to tell people how they can find your website and such. Perfect. Okay, thank stay you. right where you are, plus you get a wedding cookie on the way out. Maria, how do people find out more about your campaign for the 100th? Yes, they can go to Russo4WV.com. That's the number four. And um, they can sign up there to volunteer or to join our newsletter and to really keep up with the movement and the momentum that we're building between now and November 5th. Very good. Maria Russo, forget about it, Matt Miller. <laughs> Thanks for coming in today, Matty. Good to be here. Mr. Gilstrap, I'll see you again th Thursday, Thursday, I guess, right? Yep. Yeah. Hey, the Dave Ramsey Show is coming up next. This is Talk Radio, WRI Martinsburg and TV 10, and we'll talk with you again in 22 short hours. <laughs>